Welcome to season two, episode 11 of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us and for taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. We'd like to encourage anyone with a camera to turn it on and be present and to listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program develops students in three main pillars. One, to develop their venture and grow it into a small business. And we have a perfect example today with our guest. Two, we develop students to become innovators within a firm, to be masters of product development, service development, and to create value from ideas, even within a firm. And we have dozens of alumni who are now working for Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and all the famous tech companies. Lastly, we develop students, and probably most importantly, to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. That means to create jobs that may not exist or career paths that didn't exist today or in the past, and you be the center of focus of what your journey is. And our next guest also embodies that. Our next guest is someone who embodies this entrepreneurial journey. And prior to starting his venture, he has worked at one of the largest restaurant companies in the world to, and after this has built a multi-million dollar business through this experience and his knowledge learned there. Our next guest will be sharing about his experiences as an entrepreneur and how serendipity played in starting his discovery and it will say venture. And in my class, we talk about how the post-it note or penicillin were accidentally discovered, but today we will hear how beer battered fish help inspire him to innovate and grow into one of the largest independent breweries in Florida. Please give a warm welcome to founder and CEO of Three Daughters Brewing, Mike Harding. And we do this with sign language as we have our mics <laughs> off. So Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the annotated version of, of how we got here. Um, I, I went to college in, uh, in the 90s. Um, I'm 52 this year. So I went to college in the 90s and um, then after college, looked for, I got a degree in, in management and looked for what exists in the management world. And I ended up working in the restaurant business. Um, and that was 17 years at, uh, or 16 years at Outback Steakhouse. So I ran the original Outback, and then I developed the the southeastern or southwestern territory for Outback. So I built all the Outbacks that are that are from eh, Tampa down to down to Key West and out through the middle of the state in Winter Haven and Lakeland, and and um, and at the end we had about eighteen restaurants, and um, and all through it, it as the company developed in the very in the beginning it was very entrepreneurial. They would just say, "Hey, Mike, we need an Outback in Naples. Go go figure it out." And that was awesome for my personality, the, the, the traits that I think make a, a great entrepreneur. And, um, and as it became more corporate, uh, as it grew from what were 18 restaurants, another 20 restaurants at the time I started and over a thousand when I left, um, and it became more structured and more corporate, I realized that it was just time for me to, to move on. So I left and, uh, and we, built an, we built a restaurant in St. Pete. It's called Bella Brava and it's down on Beach Drive. And, um, and we built a, a high-end Italian restaurant. And everything was made from scratch. And along the way, um, I talked to my chef and said, listen, we make this, this beer batter fish sandwich and we use Bud Light. Let's just make beer. It's one of the few things we've never made. And he had never made it and I had never made it. And we showed up at two o'clock in the morning and, and made beer in our kitchen. And it was fun. It was a great story to tell. And, uh, and we enjoyed doing it. And, and, uh, and so I decided, well, let's just make it and put it on tap. And then we thought about, well, there's this little there's this little hair salon that's right next door to us. Let's take it over and build a little tasting room. And that that became we went out looking for equipment and um, and we found a much bigger piece of equipment. The one we wanted was about 14 grand. The one we ended up with was 635 grand. Uh, my wife was none too pleased about all this. Uh, but I've got so I've spent enough time in this community that I that I, I knew um, we have I'll back up a step. We have 15 investors. That, uh, that put in a grand total of $2 million. And I raised another $3 million at the time. And I had a buddy who owned an old burned out warehouse. 
and it seemed like the right thing to do and we took the leap and we and we built uh we built three daughters brewing in the industrial district middle of nowhere in in saint pete and the the thought was we're going to put beer in kegs and see if we can get bars to carry it and uh and eventually we bought a canning line and started canning and the the tasting room people started showing up for this part of our business the tasting room part and so we we expanded that over the years and um and at and so the the progression of of us was beer wasn't enough and it turns out that that we went from seven years ago a couple hundred breweries in the country to today over nine thousand and so that part started to get more difficult and so that that is to me that's what entrepreneurs do they innovate and so we got a wine making license and we started making cider and then truly came along this this idea of hard seltzer, uh, which seemed to be a, a an idea that was going to stick. So we started making hard seltzer, which which is a, an interesting other time story about beer is really just an art, but seltzer is a science. Um, and so we built our lab much bigger, and we now have a federally certified lab that uh, that's a component of our business. And um, and then last we added a non-alcoholic component. We make liquid, and we put it in cans. So. Um, so we we played around one day just to see if we could make Mountain Dew, and we did, and it was pretty good. So we got a we have uh, licenses, state and federal licenses, to make non-alcoholic products, and we cold brew coffee and some other things. So so we are now we've expanded from being a brewery to to really producing any human consumable liquids. Um, we uh, we've we have fumbled our way through, never done this before, building a sales team. Um, we expanded around the whole state of Florida. So, so we have 22 distributors that we work with throughout the entire state. And then, um, and as that was progressing, we built that part of our business. We realized that in order to get bigger, we need to leave the state of Florida. It's not easy to do that. And if you go to Georgia or North Carolina, there are lots of good breweries and we have a tendency to root for the home team. Uh, and so we kept looking at it and decided that international was the way to go. So we now sell um, we now sell product in Brazil, uh, in the islands, in France, in Spain, uh, in Costa Rica, and hopefully in Colombia soon. And um, and from there, this could, this just continues to be innovation. That's that's what it is. And so we spend an awful lot of time, my head brewer and my biochemist, um, we spend a lot of time looking at what's next and and um, and, and looking for that for us, uh, um, St. Pete Beach Blondale is what really pays the bills in our company. Uh, that's what we sell the most of. But it's a matter of looking for what's that next product, that next innovation that that becomes not just something kind of cool that's out there but doesn't sell a lot, to what can mirror that success. Um, currently, we're working on... If I can yeah, yeah. If I can jump in there, I just want to make some connections because we have students who are taking three different classes, and what you've shared covers many of the topics and themes that we cover. So if you heard from what Mike initially introduced was the idea that I'm starting an entrepreneur venture or being an entrepreneur may be complemented with experiences of working for another firm to learn, to grow, to expand, build some of the skills that transfer to his new venture uh, and, and to, to launch his new venture. So what, what, the reason why I'm bringing this up is oftentimes or there's a misconception about entrepreneurship. Meaning you either be an entrepreneur and you or you work for a company and there's no clear links. And what we see over and over as we have guests is that working for a firm also helps you build the knowledge and learn to be able to go out on your own venture. And these are not exclusive and you can weave back and forth throughout your career in order to do that. So my question would be. Clearly, you were in. Um, a creative entrepreneurial strategic role for Outback as they began to, to grow um, before they were much bigger or, or corporate. You talked about the traits of being an entrepreneur. What traits do you think did you learn or maybe you had or were able to refine in this space, meaning working for Outback? Because I know many of my students work in the service industry, in the hospitality industry. And I want to suggest that these are also valuable experiences and learning opportunities. So what advice would you have for them and what should they work on or what skills could are directly transferable from that industry to, we'll say, your entrepreneurial journey or or any other venture they choose to go out in? Absolutely. So, okay, so Outback was a was a very interesting opportunity for, I, I think that, that 
that I have been an entrepreneur my whole life. I just didn't go out and do it. But there are certain, in my opinion, there are certain traits that that true entrepreneurs have. They're not better. They're not worse. They're not smarter. They're just different. Um, one of those is is the the need to lead and not be led. Um, to to go out and be the one that actually comes up with the idea and makes that idea happen. And and Outback offered me that opportunity in that they would they would turn to me and say, Mike, now we've got the money. Let's build two more restaurants. Go. And we didn't have a depart. We didn't have a real estate department and this this and this. And so I got to go out and and develop these skills um, of how do I find property? How do I find a contractor? How do I? What is it? What does it mean to to permit a building? Um, how do I hire a staff from the ground up? And so Outback um, it, it grew into departments that did this for the the folks that do what I did. But I had the opportunity to start to polish those skills or or learn those skills. Um, the the being in leadership in a in a corporate environment offers you the opportunity to really understand the financials. I had learned um, through business courses in college. I had learned about about P and Ls and balance sheets, the two the two documents that that really guide the financial part of any business. It's all the same regardless of, of what you, your service or 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 what you produce. But understanding the intricacies of 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 how to draw on revenue and then what that revenue goes to. And so that that basic management of the financial part of what we do, um, I really got to hone those skills on I- inside the Outback environment rather than than out on my own where capital is much more limited. Um, the the other thing that the the other freedom that that it gave me in this particular environment and something that I think is very important to entrepreneurs is I think that true entrepreneurs really look at this world and think there's a reasonable chance I'm going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. So we need to do it today. No committees. No, we're going to be very smart about this. But if we can do something, we're going to do it today. Um, and last on that list, and I think it's very important to to the the innovation of being an entrepreneur is the is I had a I had a, a safe environment to fail in. Um, in three daughters, we fail all the time. In fact, we embrace failure. Um, and the, and the idea is let's start, let's start out these ideas in a cost effective manner within the confines of the revenue that we have, and then let's judge it very quickly. And if it's going to succeed, let's pump more into it. And if it's going to fail, let's realize that it's going to fail, get rid of it tomorrow and start working on the next idea. Wonderful. And particularly for the students who are taking the scalability class. We talk about innovation, and while we often give cases or suggest uh, some of these famous companies, innovation is deeply tied to these small and medium-sized enterprises, and the experience and what Mike has shared is perfect example. Move fast, test, at, be agile, which is exactly the methodology we're learning in the scalability, right? Test our hypothesis to a minimum viable product, to know if it's going to be how it's going to be accepted or get feedback from the market, adapt, adjust, or pivot or whatever as a result from that information and move on. And you could see from Mike's list of new products that he's developed over the past years, you know, hard seltzer, cider, he's figuring out how to do that, seeing how it's rewarded in the market, and then adjusting, expanding, or closing if, if needed. So, and I also want to highlight, so yes, we can think of beer, the beer industry or the brewing industry, but what Mike really suggested was a different way of framing the problem he's solving. And he used it as, correct me if I'm, uh, consumable humid liquids. Yep. Is that, so yeah. that's very different than just saying, I'm a beer company or a brewing company or a hard seltzer or a cider company. So that there's no uh, product category that can't be tapped into potentially. Could you speak a bit about that, Mike, This where you came up with that and why you chose to pivot to frame it like this, uh, this type of problem? Sure. So the, the, the industry that, that we have chosen is capital intensive. It's P&L friendly. We're able to make a lot of money. Um, but a lot of that, a lot of that, that net income goes to the fact that we're a capital intensive business. It costs us, I used to build outbacks for 1.3 million. It costs $5 million to build this place. Um, and so we have a big nut. It's a lot of borrowed money, and we've got a big nut that we need to cover at the end of every month. And um, and so as we looked at at the success we were having with making beer and, and selling it in the state of Florida, 
I looked at the the progression of where we could get to, and it just wasn't enough. And so, so we started to take a good hard look at what it is that we had. We have the ability to uh, to to brew things, to ferment things, to mix things, to can things. So, what else can you do with that? And um, and and as we really started to look at at the business model that we built, and what else can we do with it? We realized that we can make other things, and we can make other things pretty easily. And uh, and so it just took some time to 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 really kind of understand. We took a long look at the cider industry. It turns out that, and it's the best example I have. It turns out that cider is not a very big part of the spirits industry, right? It's beer is the biggest, um, spirits are the second, wine is the third, um, cider is the fourth, and then kombucha is really the fifth. But cider is a really small part of it. But in looking at it, cider hasn't gone through this 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 innovation and decentralization that uh, the beer has gone through. So not a lot of people drink cider, but there aren't a lot of companies that make cider and no one has innovated it. When three years ago, you could go and buy apple cider. And, uh, and so we just started playing around we made cider. We made a, a, uh, uh, what was it? It was like a pink lemonade cider. We sold it here in the tasting room and people loved it. And I thought, okay, well, what if we just try to reinvent cider in the state of Florida with, different flavors in it. So we put key lime juice in, in a cider, key lime cider. And, um, and last year, well, COVID doesn't count. 2019, we sold over a million dollars of it um, after doing it for two years. And, uh, and, and so it's really a matter of, we wrote this business plan. We knew who we wanted to be when we first started. And on day two, it's important to look at, at what it is that you intended and how that's going. And after year one, we looked at it and thought, well, we can, make um we we have the infrastructure to make about six hundred thousand cases of uh of product and we were making at the time about one hundred and thirty thousand cases so we have we we the production part of us is uh, uh is rare and ready to go we've got a big v8 engine and it's currently yada so okay what else can we do with it and that and that's where that 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 thought of innovation started and and once we started making cider, we were already thinking about uh, about what else can we do with this infrastructure. And I forgot one other point. We um, we started brewing for other companies. And so if you ever find South Beach Brewing or St. Pete Brewing or or um, Sea Dog or uh, there are two other companies that those products are made, we make them for those companies and just white label them to whatever they want and sell them. So we found other ways to use the the machine that we had built. Wonderful. So you can start seeing how the business model have changed. Not only has the products changed and how is it, how Mike and, and the company is expanding their product line, but also changing, adding different um, approaches to the business model where they can brew for others and white label, et cetera, to maximize the manufacturing, bottling, and, and the whole process. I'm curious to know what are the biggest challenges you faced growing your, your venture? I know last time we spoke, you talked about uh, not no set mentors or regional support. Uh, I guess what what were some of the biggest challenges you faced early on? Uh, probably the biggest challenge that we faced was that we'd never done this before. Um, th this was we grew up and I brought a the, there are eight eight members of our team worked with me at Outback and then at Bella Brava. So our company is seven years old, but we have folks that that here that we've been working together for uh, Abel and Ty and Steve and I have been together for more than 20 years um, and they they came with me as we went from venture to venture and we grew up in the restaurant business we knew the restaurant business pretty well we did not know uh, and making beer is not hard it's, it's actually pretty easy but we didn't know we'd never worked in manufacturing and we'd never worked with distributors on this just things. So there's a learning curve that we really had to go through in terms of figuring out how the vertical works in our particular industry, and then the nuances of it. Um, that working with a working with retailers and distributors is not the easiest thing in the world. So we work with about twenty, we work with twenty two distributors and about four thousand retailers right now. And um, and I had been a retailer, but I didn't understand what it's like when my product is really just a teeny, teeny, tiny part of, you know, we have two shelf facings in Publix of the of the the 23 aisles that they have of, of literally tens of thousands of products. We're just two of them. And and how do we how do we resonate inside the Publix environment? And all that we learned as we went. 
And, we, and quite frankly, we screwed it up more than a couple of times. <laughs> so what I like, I like, I appreciate the honesty, Mike, but you can see our last uh, guest uh, last week was a consultant. And he talked about how he might have to solve problems for industries he didn't know anything about and he needed to get up to speed. It sounds like you also had to get up to speed about learning about different aspects of the business. Like you said, manufacturing, supply, whatever the case may be. So you have to become masters of many different areas if you're an entrepreneur. Not so different than the consultant who goes from industry to industry. And so this idea of continuously learning, diving into research, being comfortable, knowing the back end and ins and out is what you have to consistently do regardless of what profession or career you want to go into, or particularly if you're an innovator or an entrepreneur. Wonderful. What do you think the biggest challenges are that you're facing currently? The for us, it is um, that that this industry uh, quite literally exploded. So if you go back to the 80s and 90s, there there in our industry, there was Budweiser, Miller and Heineken and a few others. And there were some craft, not a lot, but, uh, you know, we, we were able to get Yingling and and Sam Adams. And really, in the 80s, there were probably less than 100 breweries. And this phenomenon of, of I can do this in my town, I can decentralize from, from these massive breweries in, in St. Louis, and I can do this in my town, uh, really started to take hold. And that, that idea of getting a, a much better quality product that's made local, by local, um, really kind of started that that was the genesis of we can make this, we can make this happen. So we became, when we opened seven years ago, we were kind of, we were the new kid on the block trying to take some market share from these big companies. And there was a tremendous amount of support for that. And we did pretty well. Move five years ahead, and we're now part of the institution. And all these new breweries coming along are taking market share from us. So we went from hundreds of breweries to, in, 20, in 2019, there were, I want to say there were about 13,000 breweries nationally. Um, from a local brew pub to to all the way up to Budweiser, and so that competition became much much harder, and we had to get we we had to get better at product innovation, and we really had to get better at the infrastructure of how do how do we interact with large companies like Winn Dixie and Publix and Total Wine, um, because those the 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 distributors are massive, the producers are massive, the retailers are massive, and they all integrate very well. They spend money on software that integrates the the entire vertical. We can't do that. We don't have the resources to do that. So how do we develop systems that at least let us kind of sneak in a side door? And and what we found was working with big retail boxes um, that they are as interested in in the product and the innovation and having something new on their shelves as they are in, can you make this easy for us? We can't spend an awful lot of time trying to bring you up to speed. You got to do that on your own. I'm really impressed because when the students take macroeconomics or microeconomics, or even if you read some of the, the readings that we have in our class, particularly around economist Joseph Schrumpeter, who created the concept creative destruction, Mike talks about this idea of first he was a disruptor trying to decentralize some of the industry and, and produce it locally. And now he finds himself part of the establishment or this broader institution, and he's seeing the competition from other breweries. And that's trying to take his market share, trying to take bigger market share from the bigger breweries and the other competitors. So we can start seeing how the market is changing. And this is the idea of what entrepreneurs do. They disrupt existing markets. And this is a perfect example. So before he was always looking at the bigger giants, right? Miller, Budweiser. But now he's also being mindful of his competition behind him and who's coming up with different products, different ways of doing things, expanding into his markets, how he's re they're reaching his customers. So this is a perfect example. Thank you, Mike. As you mentioned, the beer world ex exploded here in St. Pete in the Tampa Bay area. Right now it's cool. We have a brewing arts program even here at USF. We think of it as sexy. We want to know what is unsexy about brewing in the beer world. Sure, absolutely. It is. Um, it is all the supporting elements that that you have to build in order to become a viable company. Um, the 
So we own 7,000 kegs and those kegs are, are sent out to market and then we need to get them back and wash them and clean them and fill them and get them out again. And, uh, and we knew absolutely nothing about logistics, n- not a thing. Um, and, and we had to develop a logistics program. We own trucks. We, um, so we take our product um, which, which you know how much a keg weighs. Now put eight of them on a pallet, and now fill a truck with with uh, with 24 of those pallets. And we need to find a way to make sure that our distributors order enough beer, and we're able to get it to them, and we're able to produce enough. And so, um, and so those components that go into building a larger company, um, we didn't have an HR department. We didn't have a, um, a logistics department. We didn't have a um, we didn't have any really accounting. It was me. Um, and I took accounting one and accounting two, and that was kind of the end of it. And so developing those pieces that along the way that that you have to add in order to grow, that's really the unsexy part. When you look at our company, um, the, when you look at it from the outside in, we're, we're a beer manufacturer. But when you look at it from the inside out, we're just a company who happens to make beer. And so that idea of how do we grow the pieces and parts that that take care of our employees, take care of our investors, um, and really the the engine that makes all this run, it, it's no different than any other company. Wonderful. And this is why there's a body of knowledge known as entrepreneurship and innovation. It doesn't particularly matter. Of course, there's nuances to every industry and every business and every geographic region. But there is a block of knowledge, which is what we teach in the program, that is transferable to industries, different companies, or different ways of doing business. But there are some foundations. Of course, you have to mold it to your industry, and you have to continuously learn, and you have to continuously get out of your comfort zone to do the unsexy part, to figure the problem out. And my students are doing that in many of their their projects. So, So thank you for sharing that. I would like to prime the students now uh, to think about the questions that you have for Mike. And I'm going to ask Mike a few more questions. In one of my classes, we talk about personas and the customer journey. I'm curious to know because you create a lot of different human consumable liquids, such as beer, cider, seltzer, uh, non-alcohol. Maybe you'll move into CBD. Are there different profiles of drinkers and how do you meet their needs or how do you go about uh, identifying or what do you do differently um, as opposed to lumping them all as the same? Sure. Uh, so we are, we're, we're interesting in two regards. One is we have an enormous geography that we cover. And the other is that we sell a product at a, at a very low cost. Um, so, so we're not marketing a, a, a $50,000 software package. We're selling at, at our end, we're selling a $5 six pack of beer. And so there is, there is quite frankly, not an awful lot of, of, of capital available to reach out to consumers. And, um, and what we found, and we did in the beginning, we spent money on, um, especially on social media platforms, on how do we advertise to the consumers. And what, what we found in our industry is, it is we just need to be there. So that, that marketing dollar, if you will, or that marketing budget that we have available to us, we spend it on retailers and distributors, and we really don't touch consumers. Um, the The idea in our business is we just need to be on the shelf and present for someone to make a choice. So we're we're in. Um, we we spent a lot of time and effort. I use Publix because they're the 800 pound gorilla in the state, but um, but we spent a lot of time and energy and effort recruiting um, recruiting uh, Publix as, as to carry our product. And we're in about, I think we're in about 540 out of about 850 Publixes in the state of Florida. And, uh, and so as Publix does, uh, has programs where their team shows up and they, they have a program called Saver where they, they travel around the state. They have it in different places and they invite, um, they invite their manufacturers to show up and they do trade shows, if you will. And that's five grand a pop every time we do it. And so we spend about 25 grand a year going to these different saver events to make sure that we're in front of the decision makers inside of that organization. We spend uh, a lot of time and effort visiting our distributors um, and and providing their sales team with paraphernalia and shorts and uh, shirts and training. And so that's about a that's about a uh, that's about a seventy five hundred thousand dollar venture 
to to try and endear their sales teams to our product. Um, but again, until you get to until you get to the size of a of a Budweiser um, or really the size of a say a dogfish head, there's not a lot of capital available to reach consumers directly. And so to answer your question, we um, we innovate, we come up with new products. We're working on a on a, on a whole different line of seltzers right now. We'll, we will spend time, energy, and effort uh, and money trying to get Winn-Dixie and Total Wine and those types of uh, companies, because that's that's the low-hanging fruit for us, to just bring them in. And it's a pretty expensive endeavor. From there, it's, you, you know, you look at, at the Publix by my house. It's one of the busiest in the country, one, one across the street from the other. And each one of those Publixes does over $50 million a year. So if you can just be on the shelves in one of those Publixes, enough people walk by that you'll that that you'll get the attention of the that that leading edge of trying of the folks that want to try something new that you'll get pull through. So I'd like so, to take right. a step. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'd like to take a step back because my students are super talented and I see it in their work. One thing that always comes up or maybe it's human nature is that fear of getting started or taking that leap. So my question to you is, how did you know you were ready to start your venture? To get okay, over that a, hump? That's a really good question. Um, that, that to me comes back to um, the, the, the heart of an entrepreneur. Again, I truly believe, I really do truly believe that it's not the smartest person in the room. It's not the, 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 the person with the most charisma. Um, it, it is someone who has formed a good plan who truly enjoys the leadership or has the leadership skills to do this. And that the, the probably the last piece of that is eventually you have the confidence in, in your idea and your plan and your business plan. And you really just take that leap of faith. And that's exactly what it is. In, in my opinion, that, that entrepreneurs are willing to take that leap of faith. And at some point in time, you have to dive into the deep end of the pool without a life preserver, swim to the middle, and just decide we're going to see what happens. I, I am I'm confident in what I've done. I've raised enough capital. I've got a good plan. I I, I believe in what I'm doing. Um, but at some point in time, you just have to do it. And um, and working in the restaurant business um, and owning my own restaurant, I I got to know an awful lot of people. And um, and I heard this story a couple times throughout my career of of you know a, a, a gentleman or a young lady or a lady that older retired. And uh, and I would, and they would talk about the restaurant. I say, you know, I had this great idea. I really wish I would have tried it, uh, but I just I, I never. And so that the really the answer to your question is that 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 true entrepreneurs are risk tolerant, and we're and at some point in time you just go. That's it. You just go. One of the factors or things that we try to get the students to be comfortable with is I don't know about risk, but certainly ambiguity and uncertainty. Do you think that's the more comfortable someone is with dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty would help them in creating a venture or being an entrepreneur or an innovator? So oh, absolutely. There, there's a, a certain amount of confidence that you have to have in yourself um, to know that 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 I have absolutely no idea if it's if this will truly honestly work, but I believe in myself. Um, and and so there there is that need to just take that first step. And that's a, it's a, it's, it, it is a, I, I don't mean it in a truly in an emotional sense, but it's kind of a cathartic moment when you really look at yourself and you say, tomorrow, we're just going to do it. Excellent. Hopefully we can take that away and continue pushing with our ideas, our interests, our careers, and, and be empowered to create that journey and, and whatever future that we want. So I would like to open the floor for, for questions if the students have have any. Don't be shy. Uh, I'm confident Mike has lots of wonderful and interesting stories. So Sienna, maybe you can play conductor. Yeah, Ethan. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions. So obviously collaboration is a big part of entrepreneurship, not only within the venture, but outside of it as well. So I was wondering, since the, um, the beer market is very competitive. Do you ever collaborate with your competitors on new beers? And then if you do, do you ever combine ideas from like both breweries? Maybe there's one beer that you have that you want to combine with one of their beers to make something new. 
the good question. So so we collaborate uh, an awful lot. I talk to a lot of different breweries. We actually have a, a guild um, in the state of Florida. Uh, there's a national guild and every state has one. Uh, ours is called the Florida Brewers Guild. And of the 440 breweries in the state, I think we've got about uh, about 290 of them that belong to the guild. Um, I drew the short straw this year. I'm the president of the guild. Uh, so I talked to more, more breweries than I ever have. We uh, a lot of what we a lot of the collaboration is more things about the this is a brand new industry. Um, how do I dot dot dot? I, I have no idea. I've never bought a boiler. Anybody out there know anything about boilers? In terms of product, the issue becomes it's fun to do, but the issue becomes the revenue share um, and and the idea that brand has value. So if I if I collaborate with Tampa Bay Brewing and we make something and put it out together. Um, is it made here? Is it made there? Who paid for the cans? If it takes off and the and the brand has the brand itself has value, how do you share that value? So uh, so to answer your question, Ethan, there's an awful lot of collaboration in terms of sharing of knowledge and ideas and and making my business better by learning from folks that are going through the same trials and tribulations as me, but not not an awful lot of sharing of uh, of of uh, the product itself. All right. Thank you, Mike. If, if I can jump right Absolutely. in, in our scalability class, we learn about the concept of open innovation and the assumption of open innovation assumes that you don't have all the knowledge internally to your firm, but you have to tap into external knowledge, which could help accelerate your internal innovation process. So what Mike shared was he's part of this guild. He talks to lots of breweries. He shares his knowledge. They share his, their knowledge. And this helps his company his knowledge helps other companies in various ways we also talk about open models of intellectual property and here's where things start to become more challenging these are legal issues uh ip issues and it becomes we'll say gray areas which potentially could inhibit how to collaborate and that has to do with the lack of clarity or the complexity of this type of collaboration there's ways to do it, but there are costs associated with that. Uh, but I wanted to highlight what Mike shared is directly tied to concepts that we're learning about in our course. Wonderful. Who's next? Piero. Hi, Mike. Um, my question will be, if you are a new company of spirits uh, nowadays, do you think the way to go in order of selling points will be e-commerce or traditional points such as supermarkets? Our, the, so our industry is working that out. Unfortunately, the, it, if you had asked me that question about other industries, I would say e-commerce. In our industry, though, um, the way that the laws are written, um, it, it's, it's definitely uh, more brick and mortar. So the, the state laws are different than the federal laws, and the state laws are all different than each other. And uh, in the state of Florida, we can't mail uh, out any alcohol products. So it, it will work itself out one day. Amazon, once they're done conquering the rest of the world, will figure out a way to change the laws so that we can also um, ship alcohol. But currently, it's just not a it's not. And that, quite frankly, to answer your question, that's one of the one of the reasons that we looked into non-alcoholic products and CBD products is there's an e-commerce component to both of those. But the, the unfortunate part to get into the, the sticky part of, of the answer to your question is that, uh, that liquid weighs a lot. So we sell we sell CBD uh, four packs online. The four pack is seven dollars. The shipping and handling is typically about eight to twelve dollars. So it's just it's a little bit harder with what it is that we produce in this industry. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, so if you were to do. Yes. Yes. So one quick point. Um, thank you for asking questions. Uh, the one component that I've found of, of, of entrepreneur, of really entrepreneurial endeavors is, you know, in an, in, in an environment like this, you're, you're sitting and you're thinking, I have a question. I don't know if it's relevant. I don't know if it's a good question. And you kind of, you kind of, you know, like, ah, I might ask it. I might not ask it. And, and um, in, in a, a 30 second story, we had to buy a boiler. Uh, we, we cook with steam. I know nothing about boilers. Uh, the boiler was $95,000. And so I, I talked to a, two different companies and one of the guys came out to see me and I was asking questions and you could clearly tell that he was frustrated because I didn't have a background in boilers. I know nothing about them. And so I just stopped him and said, buddy, look, 
I got ninety five thousand dollars. I'm going to buy a boiler, but you have to make me feel not stupid. You have to you have to allow me to a- answer questions that are very pedestrian because this needs to be a big component of my business. And I don't understand it. Um, and funny enough, he said he it was actually a pretty funny story. He said, let me start over. Picture a locomotive, a steam locomotive in the old west. And it, our boiler works the same way. And he started explaining it. And I said, let me ask you a question. Can I put a steam whistle on it? And he said, I've never gotten that question in all the years I've been doing this, but yes. And the first thing that we ever bought for this brewery was a one mile steam whistle. But my point is that 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 you're going to go out and you're going to do things that you know nothing about. You have an idea, you have a concept, you raise some money, you have the, 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 the desire to do this. And if you're going to really get there, you have to ask a lot of stupid questions and you have to understand that there's no such thing as a stupid question. And truthfully, I think that if, if, you were to ask me to list the top 10 things that got us to where we are today, I would tell you that it's not the greatest term and I apologize, but stupid questions. We ask a ton of questions because there's way too much stuff that we don't know anything about. Thank you for making me laugh, Mike. I, I appreciate it. So this is why we're here because we want to learn, we want to grow, we want to become a better version of ourselves. And that's why we come to the open educator. That's also why when I challenge you in your homework to go out and continuously learn and to do research, because this is a perfect example. You cannot master everything before you start your venture. There's going to be things that you don't know, and you're going to have to get up to speed quickly because you have to make a decision. There's people on your tail trying to compete with you. You need to grow. You need to make a decision, and you have to figure out how you're going to learn about whatever problem you're trying to solve. So, Mike, I'm curious to know, how do you continue to learn? What do you, do you have a practice? Do you have something that you have a repertoire? Or what do you do to continuously learn? Because we can laugh and joke about school. Is it relevant? Is it, is it not sure. relevant? But I push my students to be, you know, push themselves to grow, to do research, to learn. And they need to have a learning journey throughout their life. Because regardless, they can't get old and stale and find themselves without a job or whatever, but how do you continuously learn and how do you motivate yourself to continuously learn? Sure. Um, the, so two two answers to your question. One is that you realize that there are some things that you're never gonna learn, um, but they're pieces and parts of, of your organization. The greatest, the best example I have is we have a full-time biochemist. Um, we recently finished building our lab, um, all the components and we bought a PCR. So we have the, we have the ability here to test for COVID um, with this piece of equipment. I have no idea what it does. It's called a PCR. I don't even know what it stands for. But what I do have is a biochemist who has that background, who understands all that and makes that component of our business work. And you have to let some pieces of your organization go and, and have a trust in your team. As to my part in this company, um, the I, I spend an awful lot of time learning. Again, I'm 52, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Right. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that I still don't know. So we get every trade magazine in the world um, that's available and I read every single one of them. There are um, there are now with uh, with this, with online learning, um, it's become more more prolific. But there are always um, trade shows and and folks giving talks. And so we attend all of them. I, I don't attend all of them, but if I find we we recently joined the the National Cider Association. And so I've got my biochemist and my head brewer um, on some of the calls learning about the intricacies of making cider. Um, I joined a group to learn about uh, buying and exercising um, futures contracts. So we buy for for grain, um, for grain and hops and um, and apple juice. I actually buy futures contracts and exercise those contracts. I, I I remember that somewhere in finance one, they talked about futures contracts. That's about all I knew. So I had to educate myself on on how to actually buy and sell futures contracts. So so any to answer your question, anything that I find and our team knows as well, if you find something that you think you can learn from, bring it to me and uh, and a hundred bucks to, to join a call like this. We're in um, and an hour of my time. You're always going to learn something from it. I hope we take this to heart, the idea that we need to be hungry, we need to be consuming, we need to be that we need to be leveling up our learning game. And that's not just because we're in university, but 
every single day of our lives to be a better version of ourselves for, for personal reasons, but also for professional reasons. I'm going to go a little off script here, Mike, and sure. I don't know if this is a curveball, but we are going to the future. Let's say 10, 15 years from now, what does the brewing industry look like or what does experiencing a beer look like or what what does the industry hold and take us to year 2035 we'll say how has the industry changed if we can any predictions sure so uh absolutely the 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 industry itself continues to expand right you you've seen Lots of things that have come out and, and not not worked, like not your father's root beer, just a meteoric rise and an even bigger fall. But some things come along and stick, and and hard seltzer is a big one. And so hard seltzer came out as as no calories, no carbs, no sugars, but five percent alcohol, and and just it, it's unstoppable now. And so now there's an innovation to add color and flavor, and can we turn it into uh, can we turn it into a margarita? And um, and and my point in all this is that innovation is not going to stop. So the 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 thing that we're facing right now that has come on in the past six months with a with a fire is um, is ready made cocktails out of spirits. Um, that you can buy a, 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 a 5% vodka drink that's made into a dot, dot, dot. Um, and that seems like it's going to stick. And so we're and on our end, we're looking at what's called a rectifying license, um, where I, can, I, I, can't, I can't distill here, but I can buy bulk vodka and turn it into, uh, turn it into a product and put it in a can. And so my, my point being is that, that the idea that that alcohol is part of the of the hospitality business and and part of the celebrations that go on from fourth of july to the super bowl to whatever or just a friday night at home watching a movie that part's not going to change um i i think that um corona has spent a billion and a half dollars in canada and there are just trucks packed on the border waiting for this to happen but um, but there will be THC infused drinks. Um, and so do we do we participate in that or not? Um, the CBD craze is, uh, you know, currently and that's that's a great example. Um, hemp, hemp and marijuana, right? Hemp was pulled off of schedule two narcotics. It's perfectly legal. You can get it in most places. You can buy salve for your pets. Um, people now buy it and rub it on their elbow for tennis elbow. But it's not. And so it's perfectly legal, but it's not. Uh, it hasn't been codified by the FDA. So, um, so although it's legal, you can't currently, and well, you can um, sell it in Publix, but Publix doesn't want it yet until the FDA is done, and they'll be done in the next six months. So we've looked at it and decided we're going to develop a product line. So when that happens, we're willing to take the jump. And we spent, I don't know, we probably spent 20, 25 grand on getting this product ready and getting this, this package ready. Um, because I think it'll be a big part of what becomes um, uh, the the hospitality experience. So I don't have an exact answer to what's going to what it's going to look like in ten years, but but that idea that we'll continue to in innovate with seltzers and canned cocktails and THC and in seltzer or whatever that's not going to stop. And um, and and it's going to be the companies that stay up with those trends that uh, that will make it. So I've traveled a few places and I know that in Japan, Australia, they have these regular made cocktails in cans. So we can be we can learn what's happened there. Of course, their laws are different. Social behavior is different, but we can start seeing where thing we might be learning, able to learn from other parts of the world as well. So this is good. Uh, thank you for sharing what the future in 2025 right. will be. We're excited for all these new products. I'm also curious to know, because I know one of my students in, in Siena, she has a venture idea and she started, and it has to do with recycling or uh, sustainability or utilizing su uh, sustainable practices or capitalizing on the sustainability trend. Do you see that playing a, a unique role in your business or is there a way to partner or how could how could one who's interested in tapping in this sustainability trend partner with you or where do you see this going for your industry sure 
Um, we are on what is a, uh, a year and a half venture, I guess it's about a year and a half now, to become a certified B Corp. Um, and it, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with, uh, with B Corp status, it, it's an all-encompassing picture of, of your company and how it interacts with, with the world. A big part of it is sustainability, um, and that's the part that we've done. We've done really well on the part on how we treat our team, how we interact with our community. Um, that being a good corporate citizen, the sustainability part has been um, been very interesting and challenging. So um, the 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 end all be all is um, all of us want to be uh, all all of us want to be good corporate citizens, especially in the sustainability area of our business. A lot of it is capital related. Some of it's just some of it is just uh, it is just we we need to change behaviors, and some of it's capital related. So um, so through this B Corp process or through this journey, um, we've learned an awful lot about what it takes to be a good corporate citizen in that regard. And and there are an, there there are more companies now um, as as it's become more of a of a conversation in our society. There are more companies now than I have ever seen in, in, you know, in 30 years in business that actually focus on helping companies become more sustainable. Uh, I'll give you a, an example on our end of things that of something. And so we've done everything that we can do within the constraints of uh, how big we are and how much capital we have available. We, um, we use a lot of CO2, an ungodly amount of CO2. Um, we have a, a tank outside that could fit my pickup truck inside of it that holds CO2 and we get it filled about every three weeks. And, um, and we end up using what, what actually ends up in cans and going out to consumers is probably somewhere in the 30% range of all the CO2 that we use. And the rest of it, just uh, we just end up off-gassing um, and it's, it's perfectly legal and it's non-toxic and all that. But, um, but it's, not, it's not great for the environment and it's not great for our company. The investment and the investment into uh, CO2 reuptake is about one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, and we'll get to that eventually. But but there are now companies that actually offer products that are actually offer services and equipment that are able to recapture CO2, um, and so that 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 has become a much bigger part of our of of our culture, um, and, and I. And I see that industry becoming a much bigger part of, of our ecosystem as a whole in the country. Wonderful example. And I want to highlight that you know, these are all other opportunities for businesses to support businesses that have these problems and have these challenges. You know, they can be lucrative. They can be revenue generating. They can be sustainable. And now you're just helping other businesses meet their other needs of being sustainable, global citizen, et cetera. So we can see how, you know, these are interconnected and, and more opportunities exist. Mike, I always end our open educator with one last question. And this has been a wonderful session and experience with you. But if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you say to him? Start sooner. I would have uh, that 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 cathartic moment of I'm just going to do this didn't happen for me until I was 38, 37, right about there. Um, and there is a there is a spin up to it, right? You you start it and hopefully you're successful at it, but you're not great at it. And just like anything else, it just takes a while um, to to become good at being an entrepreneur. And the only thing that uh, that I would tell myself is, buddy, j just do it. Just that that moment where you dive into the deep end of the pool that I finally decided when I was 37, I had done it when I was 25. Wonderful. Let's take that to heart. We don't need to wait until we finish. We don't need to go for more, more and more training. Of course, we need to learn, but we need to act. And that's what we're doing here in the entrepreneurship program because we have dozens and hundreds of unique experiences and examples of students doing just that. Just do it. My this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you for spending the morning with us. I'll circle back with you, but thanks for sharing your wisdom, humor, story, and, and everything about Three Daughters and, and everything that you're doing for the community. And I could not be more grateful for the time that you're spending with us. So thank, thank you very you. much. Enjoyed it.
if any of you ever make it by, um, you've got my contact. If you ever make it down this way, I'll take you on a tour of the facility. I'll show you what we do. Um, but but you guys attending this today, regardless of, of the the uh, the 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 content, um, th this is to me, this is an opportunity that you have to start to learn about uh, about about how all this really works. Um, so I greatly appreciate the the efforts of, of USF and and your your efforts in particular, and thanks for your time, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. We will circle back soon. All right, take care, guys. I'll take you up on the offer about the beer tour as well. Thank you. Yeah, come on. Perfect. Have a good day. Thanks, Mike.